me welcome those of you in the room, and Professor Jack Goldstone uh, through, uh, through Skype to uh, the defense of Ashad Santango's dissertation. I'm uh, Terence Lyons, the chair of the committee. On my left is uh, Susan Hirsch uh, from, uh, from the School of Conflict Analysis and Resolution. And behind me on the screen is Jack Goldstone, the outside reader from the School of Conflict Policy here at George Mason. I want to, uh, I'm very excited to be here today to hear uh, Ashad uh, do his presentation. This has been a wonderful project to watch uh, develop, uh, to have Ashad as a student in my seminar and uh, to work with him on developing this proposal in this research uh, in his sort of fierce uh, determination to, to develop his argument, to, to investigate very uh, important, very uh, you know, sort of deeply rooted social processes and at the same time his very detailed and rich and fine-grained knowledge of the important case of Uganda. And so I've learned a lot from Ashad as we've gone through this uh, process and look forward to his presentation uh, his, uh, of his dissertation. We'll give uh, about uh, 30 minutes or so, I'll give you a little bit of the so, but not too much more than the uh, uh, so, uh, to do your presentation, and then the committee will have questions and we'll open it up to the uh, larger community. So, Ashad, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Terence and uh, the committee for guiding me to this stage and uh, uh, giving me the go ahead to say it's now time to come to come to come and uh, make a presentation um, and um, basically the study I conducted was in the broader areas of power sharing and ethnic conflict and focused on how decentralization of state power improved relationships between ethnic groups and the state the problem that led to this investigation is a protracted conflict, as, as I would say, between Buganda and the central government that has existed since uh, independence. What made it very attractive in the context of decentralization is that the grievances around which the conflict continues are the uh, the grievances that theorists and even the central government in Uganda claims that the system is supposed to solve. More autonomy and authority for self-rule in a kind of federal arrangement, that's what Buganda claims. The control of local resources, land and collection of local revenue. Executive power to the king, the traditional authority of the, the monarchy and participation in decision making. Now, the assumption according to the decentralization policy strategic framework within the by, uh, developed by government is that popularly elected local governments are better placed to identify and respond to needs and demands of accountability. But this did not happen. In Buganda, it did not. But in other regions, in Uganda, including Bosoga, the system responded to these grievances fairly well. This was more evident when, during the constitutional review process in 2003, when Buganda Kingdom proposed that the system of decentralization should be abolished and instead requested for a federal system of arrangement where the region would have more authority, more power to control resources and decision making. On the other hand, Busoga Kingdom proposed that decentralization should be allowed to continue. The investigation was therefore focused on what explains the difference. The research question, therefore, was does decentralization improve relationships between ethnic groups and the state? And the sub-questions were how do the Bagana and Basoga ethnic groups understand decentralization? I thought I would explore that dimension first. And secondly, how does the system improve perceptions 
interests and interactions between ethnic groups and the state. I'll explain why those three are important in this study, and then how can the system contribute to an improvement. The study is rooted into broad theories of power sharing. One developed by I'm Alan. Using sound here. Yeah, we're getting interference. Uh, okay. yep. Is it better yeah. now? Yep. Kevin went. Alrighty. <laughs> Alan Ridgeford, under consociation theory, he developed this power sharing system, consociation theory, and argues under consociation theory that power sharing functions to manage conflicts in ethnically divided societies. <clears throat> and he proposed four mechanisms, grand coalitions, proportional representation in government, minority guarantees, and segmented autonomy with high levels of self-governance. This study focuses on one, segmented autonomy with high levels of self-governance, which is a form, in a way, decentralization of state power to lower levels of government. But according to Sisk, he was saying, these mechanisms cannot achieve consensus in ethnically divided societies where ethnic groups have long histories of conflict. So he developed the integrative theory and he's saying we need to go to create incentives that promote moderation. And in the context of decentralization, he proposed the dispersion of territorial power to take the heat off the central focal point. In both cases, both theorists claim decentralization is an approach that can function to manage conflict in ethnically divided societies. But again, in a traditional sense, power sharing is not a new concept in traditional communities. In Buganda, power rotates. The king, kingship rotates between the 52 clans. And that is a form of power sharing, power rotation. And it is similar to what is co common in Darkborn Kingdom in northern Ghana where you have two families, Andani and, uh, and Abdu families, that about over 150 years ago agreed to rotate power between themselves. So there are mechanisms, and as I will show later, where power rotates and circulates and is decentralized in a traditional sense. The idea in this study is then how does the system of decentralization mediate these authorities? these powers and perceptions and functions. So this is the framework of the study. Once the study visualizes the state to decentralize its systems and functions to lower levels of government, with the goal to achieve, to expand the scope of government to reach as broad, as many people as possible, and increase political leadership at the local level through election of political leaders, and these are assumed or are said to be autonomous local governments in which people participate. Most of the studies on decentralization of state power focus here. Systems of devolution, they will talk about devolution, decentralization, delegation here. This study aimed to take the debate further to say that decentralization occurs in communities that have a culture, that have a history, that have identities that shape the way they perceive and interact with government to achieve their interests. So I thought that I should take this debate further to see how interaction between the state and ethnic groups occurs once these are implemented and these interests are fulfilled. This is the framework of the study. I looked at the concept of relationships on the other side of the framework as Sandole argues that conflicts manifest in relationships. And Harold Sanders argues that this relationship is an analytical concept that can actually guide us to understand conflict situations, what occurs in conflict situations. And he argues that relationships contain interests 
between parties, between people in a relationship, identity, power relations, patterns of interaction between people within a relationship, and perceptions. And I explored this dimension in the context of ethnic groups and the state. Different studies in decentralization, briefly, have not explored that approach, that dimension of how decentralization can improve relationships. They have focused on structures and systems of government. These others have looked at how the system guarantees groups a role in the state, institutions and mechanisms for elite consensus, uh, electoral systems and legal frameworks. This study by Lubanga was actually very interesting because it compared Uganda, decentralization in Uganda and in Sweden. But the, because the president of Uganda who actually introduced decentralization was in exile in Sweden for years. So he uprooted the system and implemented it in Uganda. But of course, as you can know, that historical legacies of colonialism, ethnic configurations in Uganda and Sweden are completely different. So the idea being, how, do, how should the electoral systems or legal frameworks function in Sweden and in Uganda? That could pose the problem. Other studies explore the relationship between central government and, uh, and local governments, devolution in Africa, Asia, decision making by the state, ANC, and Indonesia. This study is also interesting because both ANC Decentralization after ANC and in Indonesia were, were adapted after dictatorial regimes of Suharto in 1995 and apartheid, end of apartheid in 19. So it was important to notice that he came to the decision that the state continues to take decisions in decentralization because the state wanted control where dictators had messed up. The gaps in this study are, one, as observed by SISC 1996, that up, such approaches to power sharing, they overestimate the difference between communal groups and leaders. The assumption that once you elect local leaders and have a local government that respond, then they respond to local needs, is overestimated. But it is also underestimates the power and, relation and role of popular dissatisfaction, especially once that popular dissatisfaction, as in Buganda, is qualified culturally and ethnically. If it is qualified in cultural terms and say, we are entitled to this, such dissatisfaction is underestimated in power sharing processes. As Mela argues, he looked at power sharing systems and agreements in post-conflict, he mentions that what is always missing are the locals in those negotiations and programs. And as Okuku observes, these are the ones that always need to protect and preserve their identity and culture. Those gaps are consistent with decentralization in Uganda, which evolved as synonymous with the movement political system that the President Museveni and the NRM crafted, and it helped to create a one-party state where people were told, once you don't need political parties, you have local governments. So the movement system was adapted where local governments were the structures in which people participated. It initially evolved as a strategy to win the civil war, where local governments in liberated areas were collecting information on the enemy, about the enemy, and then Mamdani, Mahmoud Mamdani was commissioned in 1993 and he recommended in a study to adapt it as a political system that is implemented through locally elected autonomous local governments and it takes those different forms. Political decentralization as devolution, administrative decentralization is also there as decongestion and fiscal decentralization where funds are uh, allocated at the local level. This is briefly a structure that shows decentralization choices and outcomes. 
But what is clear from this diagram is the absence of how the group responds to grievances that existed within the state even before it was adopted, before the system was implemented. So this is again consistent with other studies that look at structures and how power, how people are elected and money is dispersed. But how that translates into the way states and groups meet their interests and perceive the state is completely missing. What emphasizes the importance of that dimension is this slide. That in Uganda, 53, according to studies by Afrobarometer, 53% of Ugandans prefer to identify, to be identified by their ethnic group. That shows a strong inclination towards ethnicity, even when the system has been implemented for 20 years. 37% of Baganda feel that the conditions are worse off than other tribes. 20 29 in north and 16 in eastern region. And 65% of local people in Uganda feel this, that decentralization opportunities favor western region. The importance of these slides, these three, is the indication of ethnic comparison that takes place in the context of decentralization. That ethnic comparison continues. People still have grievances ways of looking at themselves vis-a-vis -vis others, and how decentralization functions to mediate that remains unexplained. 90% of Baganda have preferred a federal system of government, and 65% of people from other regions. That, the slides instead point to that enduring gap section or need that decentralization has not responded to. So I conducted a, a, a comparative case. I, I, I conducted the study in central and eastern regions of Uganda, and the time scope was 1993 to 2011. 1993 is very important because traditional institutions were burnt in 1960, abolished in 1966, and restored in 1993. Decentralization as a system of government was officially adopted in 1993. So the two the, the cultural institutions and decentralization have more or less been evolving in, in the current times at the same time. And I looked at, that was the content scope. The importance of the study, as Kevin Avruk has maintained in one of, one of his books, that power so central to the realist view of the world remains problematic to conflict resolution theorists. So this study aims to expand on the understanding and application of decentralization in the field of conflict analysis and resolution as a power sharing system of government that can manage to transform relationships and manage conflicts in ethnic divided societies. It explains conditions under which decentralization produces those different results and also can improve relationships. And in the end, we feel, and it's my view, that the findings will be valuable to policymakers and academicians and practitioners to reduce the recurrence or the persistence of conflicts, as is the case in, in Uganda, in Buganda, once the system has been implemented. I used the structural violence theory during the analysis because I wanted to understand the difference between what is and what should be in terms of how do people achieve their interests and what are their expectations and what are they having. And as Galtung argues, the difference is the violence. I used the social identity theory to understand the kind of value systems, cultures, and identity groups use to estimate their, their positions within the government, within, with, under the system. In Buganda, for instance, as Tagfer would say, is a more coherent group. It is the largest ethnic group in Uganda. It claims 400 years history, um, civilization, it has 
uh, strategic location in, Uga in, in the central Uganda, and you, the colonists actually named Uganda after Baganda. The word Uganda is a Swahili word, which, which means land of the Baganda. But it has 53, 52 ethnic, 56 ethnic groups. The Basoga, on the other hand, are a loosely connected also total group. They are 9% of the total population. But Busoga was a creation of the colonial state out of five independent chiefdoms. So in terms of identity, social identity, you are looking at a more culturally uh, based Baganda identity against a more political identity that was uh, created out of independent chiefdoms. That speaks a lot in terms of the salience and the ability of such identity to mobilize members to claim benefits, to claim or to respond to grievances from the state. I conducted a comparative case study between Jinja and Kampala districts, which are located in the central and um, eastern regions. And I used the method of difference to select these cases because in both cases, the language is almost the same. The culture is almost the same. They are both, as traditional communities, organized into kingdoms. In the context of decentralization, where groups have needs, unique histories and demands, where would a tribal person go? That demonstrates, that shows why, despite this percentage, when, when in, in Uganda, when the, 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 the tombs where the, the, buried, the kings were buried, the, the, you know, there were demonstrations around Uganda in millions. One time when the king was traveling to one district, there is a district called Kayunga. Under decentralization, they have divided, as I will show you, a number of districts. And this district wanted to break off from Buganda. It is headed by a military man who is a former soldier. The king wanted to visit his people, and the government blocked him. That, for three days, Uganda was in riots and not only in Buganda. Until all radio many radio stations and cell phone companies were closed to stop the mobilization. Because in Western, in Eastern, because the Buganda are all over the country. This explains that concept of a total group that, that, uh, that uh, Tajfel talks about. So, The question of dual authority is also manifested in form of competing interests between the state and traditional authorities. In brief, these are the interests that the state has articulated. It wants to drive towards. Uganda is driven, the NRM government is driving Uganda towards these goals. You know, establishing democracy, resolve land seizures, and consolidate national unity and so on. In Buganda, there is the traditional concept of a biafe. Donald Horowitz has said that contested legitimacy and uncertain group worth are elements that combine to produce the politics of group entitlement. The word entitlement in Buganda is called a biafe our entitlement. In Busoga, it's called Ebiaife. The languages are almost similar. Our entitlements are defined in cultural sense, in a traditional sense. Buganda is demanding for a federal system of government because this is what, this is what gives them more power for self-rule. Buganda, while government is achieved pursuing real democracy, Buganda is uh, as demanding for federal system of government, and Busoga wants powers to traditional chiefs. 
Now, that shows you differences in interests and aspirations. The challenge in this context is how does decentralization of state power mediate this? Where, if Buganda, the government wants to achieve a national unity, Buganda is asking for executive powers, this was in the constitutional proposals, to the Kabaka to be able to appoint local leaders. But it is government that is, wants to do that. So, so this table just gives you a sense of what the interests are that decentralization is supposed to mediate, including Buganda demanding for its own police, as was the case before independence, which is not possible, <laughs> you know, maybe, which may not be possible. Buganda is also against the East African integration, and the argument is we want to know what the position of the Kawaka is going to be in a politically united East Africa. So the, the, the grievances go beyond the borders for Buganda to claim their state. And these are the interests that the dual authorities in terms of competing functions. These are the functions of local governments. When the Kabaka appoints a chief, these are the functions they expect him to fulfill. You remember that structure I showed you. So you have a king a, a, a appointed chief at a village, and you have a, an, a locally elected government. And they both want to promote education. They both want to promote, to maintain roads. In, in Buganda, it's called Burundi Mwansi. You mobilize people, and they maintain their own roads. The local government is presenting a budget to government to get money to repair the same road. You get it? In Busoga, you find that the chiefs have fewer functions, but that can be explained by the history in the creation of this, that the state was, had already taken some of these powers and functions. So the chiefs remained more ceremonial um, than in Buganda. Another finding that I came across that affects these perceptions is the fact that decentralization was actually recentralized in the process. Once after 93, after over 20 years now, over 20 years of implementing the system, government has been undertaking a number of reforms, including, for instance, initially local governments politically elected local people appointed technical staff who would manage resources, manage the money, uh, award tenders at the local level, do employ uh, local people. Now, in government reversed all that. And now it is government that employs the chief administrative officer in each district. And that is the head of administration, planning, managing resources. So the government took back the powers that it had initially given to local people. So you don't expect local people to meet their interests when they don't have the power. Government has also created new districts under the decentralization policy to say we are increasing our access of giving services to the people. Over the last five, uh, five six years, the, the number has increased to up to 136. But this is the difference. In Buganda, in the last five years, the districts have increased from 13 to 36, as opposed to only three. In Busoga, the increment is three. Buganda argues, and the Prime Minister of Buganda and the Kabaka has made a statement, that we are always opposed to government programs that keep dividing our people. The perception is that under decentralization, the system is exploited by government to create political units that it can control and manipulate, especially since over 93% of all government budgets in Uganda are funded by the government. Therefore, government pulls the shots. The key dynamic in the funding process is that all over 80% of government revenue is generated in Uganda and it is used to fund other districts. 
some of which are very unviable, but they are created by government. Now, when I asked the question, who benefits from decentralization? In Buganda, 53% said the political leaders, 35% central government, and only 12% said community. But that, this explains why. On the other hand, in Busoga, where only three districts were created, and the, the system, the, 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 the communities are more pro-government, over, I mean, 60% said community members, and 37% said the, the, the central government. Only 3% said they were unsure. That explains the difference. Now, these are some of the statistics I came across when I asked people their participation in decision-making, local interests, citizen participation, uh, to set local priorities. Let me explain the difference here. Making decisions about local interests is different when I engaged people from setting local priorities. People might be interested in repairing a road, but the priority is they should be in charge of that process. But here in Buganda, they say 70% said we have inadequate power to control that process, as opposed to uh, 42%, uh, as opposed to 13 in, 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 in Busoga. When it came to political leadership, influencing local elections, in Buganda, 57%, there is no influence. But I will explain this why. When it came to citizen participation locally, you also see the difference. These differences are explained by processes that have evolved over time to describe groups and their position and their role in maybe state formation and the group leadership and culture and dynamics. Now, part of this, especially the results on political leadership, are explained by the fact that decentralization occurs in a multi-party context. Uganda now is a multi-party, has a multi-party political arrangement. So the tendency and the motivation for locally elected political leaders to pursue party strength as opposed to serving the interests of the people is strong. And it tends to override the interests of the people. People who people, people have, uh, have uh, um, uh, perceived local governments as agents of the state, especially since they fund them, and not the local interests that the group would like to achieve. Although Horowitz has argued that um, once you, you disperse political power you, to local people, you, create, you provide incentives for moderation and cooperation. In the case of, in a multi-party context, this is not true in, in Uganda. Instead, the people use those positions to gain party strength and compete. And in any case, there are no ways that drive, there are no processes that promote moderation and cooperation. Instead, it is competition and along political lines. That tends to override um, local interests, especially since it comes with money that is this provided by government. That also promotes patronage, where the central government that gives money uh, is under the NRM rule and uh, therefore it is the movement. Moreover, the history of the evolution of these local governments, as I told you, they evolved as structures of the NRA. So other political parties tend to compete. Five minutes, okay. Now, this is what one person said, one respondent at LC3, he said, we also identify with the issues raised by Buganda to the central government. But it is wrong to expect us to fight and resolve them simply because I won an election. This was an LC3 person who is putting, you know, winning an election and the party interest and so on over. Not that they, he doesn't know. He knows and he believes in them. There is favoritism 
corruption and nepotism also favor decentralization because these occur to fulfill the interest and to promote the interests of the state as opposed to, to local system, to, to local interests. In my view, the system fails when the state and elected leaders exploit local government to enhance political interests or personal interests, party strength, careers, and tribal influence. Although Lidgefad has claimed that segmented autonomy promotes consensus building, but in the context where there is multipartism, nepotism, and corruption, consensus is very difficult to build. And the system needs, the mechanism needs to be reimagined to promote uh, consensus. One observer mentioned that local governments do not function to promote this. In any case, there is no unidirectional um, understanding of decentralization. And according to my view, decentralization, the influence on the relationships, therefore, given what I have explained, takes four dimensions. One is that you can have relations that are positive when devolution is perceived to function to fulfill the broad interests of the state and ethnic groups, including their cultural interests. But it becomes non-positive when the system functions well but remains a threat. As I told you, in Uganda, Seven, over 72 percent of people were reported that where do you go when you have a problem over 72 percent said we go to local government okay but that did not take away the threat because they ha they need more power to control local resources especially land because land is a matter of identity in Buganda you can't be a Muganda without uh, stating your land where your ancestors were buried. Okay? The system becomes non negative when it functions to frustrate people, but that frustration has nothing to do with identity and culture. That is what is happening in Busoga. There is so much poverty, there is so much mal malfunctioning of the system. But when I asked them who, who benefits from the system, over 90, 80% say communities. Why? Not that the system is effective, but it doesn't threaten them as community. In that way, the negative performance of the system becomes non-negative when there are no threats posed to culture and identity, and the group feels OK. But when all fail, the system is frustrating, but it also threatens culture. That is negative. In my view, when we are to reimagine decentralization, which is the title of my dissertation, is that the non-negative and the non-positive point to the zone of transformation. It is easier to arrive at a transformation. I used these terms to position myself against the traditional view that relations can be negative or positive. As, and to say there is always a middle area where transformation can occur. In situations where the system is fun functioning well, but threatens the culture and identity, we can reimagine the system to become responsive to tribal, to communal groups and interests. And where the system is frustrating, but no threats to identity. We can do a system-wide review so that there is improvement and professionalization in service delivery. In my view, this maps out the zone for transformation to increase the influence and the positive effect. But this remains a challenge that we can always continue to explore as the system improves. Therefore, I urge you that decentralization can improve relationships between the state and ethnic groups under conditions unique to each group, as opposed to simply adapting it as a blanket system and say, now that it has been recommended for Afghanistan and Somalia and others, say, you decentralize, but we need to know the conditions that shape the history 
of each group and how they are going to respond. So those unique conditions are explained by historical processes of forming group identities and the history of the group's participation in state formation. Because during this time, groups' perceptions and claims of entitlement are shaped and formed on how power is perceived and how control of resources should be framed. Okay? So the group's relationship can be positive when the provisions of service delivery of local governments also enable interactions with ethnic groups to achieve such cultural and identity interests. So many scholars, Coleman, Balding, and others, have said power exists in the context of interactions. Actually, Coleman's dissertation was on power sharing in organizations, and he, he said power exists in the context of interactions with institutions. Now, if local governments are institutions of power sharing, the interactions that take place within there define the kind of power that people receive at the local level. And I think that is where we need to occur. So reimagining, therefore, should aim at addressing the structural violence that threatens social identity without losing the regulatory authority of the state, because that remains important. And the non-negative, non-positive areas of influence remain the zone of transformation. And we can reimagine when we provide, for, for example, flexible mandate to include roles of these alternative forms of authority to inform what local governments should look like. Alternative forms means the traditional authorities and any other forms that exist at the local level. The system needs to be depoliticized. We need to find a way, Lichford and the others should reimagine the system, or including us, to see how depoliticization can occur of local governments in a multi-party context. Because this is important. The local person who is electing a local leader needs to, to make that decision on the basis of the services and the interests they take without the overwhelming influence of the state dictating those terms. Professionalization of service delivery, control of local resources. I talked about policy reforms to level off disparities between regions because once decentralization takes place in an area where only one region provides the resources to develop other regions, the tendency for comparison occurs. And that is why we saw the Baganda comparing themselves with other groups in the country. Um, the areas for further research, in my view, is how decentralization is to, to, to take this discussion further, to talk about how decentralization can mediate between political systems and interests of ethnic groups to produce more peaceful societies. In a polit multi party political context, that remains a big issue that has to be addressed. Consociation and consociation and integrative theories and structures still need to be explored to look at which elements should define that integration and consensus building. Because as I have told you in my findings, there are practices that undermine consensus building, including the various forms of accountability and political leadership that rhyme with the local needs and interests. And lastly, is how local governments can function as spaces of interaction between mainstream and alternative forms of authority to achieve local peace. Thank you very much. <laughs>